Welcome to The Progressive Presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, Part 2, an online U.S. history tutorial for students in 11th grade. In one area of progressivism, Roosevelt was truly ahead of his time. Although he did not begin the conservationist movement, the protection of America's natural resources, it's safe to say that he did more for conservation than all previous presidents combined and left a vast legacy for future generations of Americans. In the first century of the United States' existence, few Americans worried much at all about the depletion of their nation's resources or the extinction of some of its wildlife. America was so vast that its natural gifts seemed like they would last forever. But they were wrong. Especially as the West was settled in a generation, progress left behind stripped forests, polluted waters, and threatened species. One shocking statistic illustrates the problem. In the early 1800s, there were as many as 60 million American bison or buffalo alive in the United States. But by 1890, hunting and slaughter had reduced the species to as little as 1,000 buffalo. Theodore Roosevelt was as dedicated a conservationist as any American alive. From the time he was a little boy, the future president was fascinated, obsessed even, with the great outdoors and all of nature's living things, especially birds. Now in the White House, Roosevelt had vast powers to protect the things he loved. Over a period of six years, for example, he created 51 bird reservations from Washington to Florida. The president explained, We have become great because of the lavish use of our resources, but the time has come to inquire seriously what will happen when our forests are gone, when the coal, the iron, the oil, and the gas are exhausted. Here in the United States, we turn our rivers and streams into sewers and dumping grounds. We pollute the air. We destroy forests and exterminate fishes, birds, and mammals. Not to speak of vulgarizing charming landscapes with hideous advertisements. But at last, it looks as if our people are awakening. By the time Roosevelt left office, he had set aside a staggering 230 million acres of protected public lands. By far, the majority of it lay in the national forests of the West. In the 1890s, Congress had passed a law giving presidents the power to set aside federal forest lands in order to save them from commercial development. To put it mildly, Roosevelt took this power and ran with it, creating or enlarging 150 national forests from Puerto Rico to Alaska. On one single day, July 1, 1908, the president created 45 new national forests with a stroke of his pen. To manage the vast territories newly under federal control, in 1905 Roosevelt established the United States Forest Service, part of the Department of Agriculture. There was a backlash to the president's actions. Ironically, Roosevelt, seen by many as a Western president, tended to make enemies of real Westerners, like miners, cattle ranchers, and timber barons, who wanted to keep their state's lands open for private ownership and commercial use. As president, Theodore Roosevelt created six new national parks, including Crater Lake in Oregon, Wind Cave in South Dakota, and Mesa Verde in Colorado. And the president signed into law the Antiquities Act, which allowed him to set aside as national monuments historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic and scientific interest. Roosevelt designated 18 places as national monuments. These included Devil's Tower in Wyoming, Muir Woods in California, and perhaps most importantly of all, Arizona's Grand Canyon, which would later become a national park of its own. Said the president, in the Grand Canyon, Arizona has a natural wonder which is in kind absolutely unparalleled throughout the rest of the world. I want to ask you to keep this great wonder of nature as it now is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. The meaning of conservation itself evolved during Roosevelt's term in office. On one hand were preservationists like John Muir, the president's good friend and founder of the Sierra Club. Muir believed that wilderness must be kept in a completely pure state and protected from all commercial uses that might exploit it. On the other hand were conservationists like Gifford Pinchot, the man Roosevelt placed in charge of the newly created Forest Service. The scientifically trained Pinchot believed in managed use of protected lands. 
This meant allowing limited grazing, hunting, lumbering, and the construction of hydroelectric dams in national forests, and even in some cases in national parks, under the watchful eye of government. One event in particular illustrates the debate. In 1906, the city of San Francisco sought permission from the federal government to create a dam that would flood the Hetch Hetchy Valley in nearby Yosemite National Park, but provide the city's residents with electricity and fresh water. John Muir was adamantly opposed to the destruction of the beautiful valley in the park he had helped establish. He begged Roosevelt to oppose the project. On the other hand, Gifford Pinchot believed that creating the dam was a good example of progressivism at its best, managing federal resources to promote the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. The loss of the valley was regrettable, but necessary. In the end, Roosevelt agreed with Pinchot. The valley was flooded and remains so today. The reservoir it created is still the primary water source for the San Francisco Bay Area. Although not without controversy, Theodore Roosevelt's achievements as a conservationist represent probably his greatest legacy as president. Wherever you live in the United States, you are close to a national park, forest, monument, or bird reserve that was protected for future generations, for you, by President Roosevelt. That priceless legacy still belongs to Americans today, more than a century later. After Theodore Roosevelt was re-elected by a wide margin in 1904, he had pledged to the public that he would retire at the end of that term. It was a promise he would live to regret. In 1908, Roosevelt was only 50 years old. He was still active, popular, and he loved his job. He had served less than two full terms, and nothing in the Constitution at that time prevented him from running again. But Roosevelt kept his word and retired practically hand-picking his friend, Republican William Howard Taft, to succeed him as president. With Roosevelt's blessing, Taft easily won the White House, but his was a troubled presidency. Many Americans found him not progressive enough, and in four years, Roosevelt would come out of retirement to run against Taft for an unprecedented third term as an independent bull moose candidate. Another tutorial in this series tells this story, and that of American progressivism after Roosevelt in more detail. Roosevelt would never hold office again, but his seven and a half years in office changed America and the presidency. Before Roosevelt, a generation of presidents had played a relatively passive leadership role, leaving Congress as the driving force in government. Theodore Roosevelt blew up that dynamic. Through his determination to set and change the public agenda, as well as use presidential power on behalf of progressive reform, he redefined the presidency for the 20th century and beyond. Many call Roosevelt the first president of modern America. Certainly this accidental president changed history.